Hello and welcome to this session. This is Professor Farhat in which we would look at adjustments to net income. In the prior session, we looked at how to prepare the statement of cash flows using the direct method as well as the indirect method. And under the indirect method, if you remember, we always start with net income. Then what we do is we make certain adjustments to net income, pluses and minuses. Now we learn about those adjustments, but there are special cases, special circumstances where you would have few unusual adjustments, which they will need special attention. So the operating section using the indirect method starts with net income. Then we make certain adjustments and I'm going to list all the adjustments we're going to be covering in this session. And as if you know me, once I have a list, I'm going to go over each item on this list separately, starting with non-cash expenses, realized and unrealized holding gain and losses, changes in deferred income taxes, equity method of accounting, stock options, unusual and unfrequent items, account receivable net, changes in short-term capital changes, and non-cash transaction. Once again, I'm going to go over each item separately, explaining how each item affect somehow the adjustment to net income. Starting with non-cash expenses. Non-cash expenses, we ignore them. We don't take a look at them when we are dealing with the direct method because the direct method is converting something to a cash expense. Well, it's already non-cash expense. You cannot com convert it into a cash expense. Therefore, those non-cash expense items are ignored for the direct method. For the indirect method, Non-cash expenses, non-cash expense expenses reduce net income. So what they do, because remember, under the indirect method, what we do is we start with net income. So for the direct method, it's easy. We ignore them. For the indirect method, we start with net income and we go backward and we reconcile. So what happened is this, those non-cash expenses they were deducted to arrive to net income. Now, what do we need to do? Well, we if we're only looking for income on a cash basis, if we deduct them to get the net income, we're gonna go back and add them back. Therefore, we add to net income. And what are some examples of non-cash expenses? Well, the main one is depreciation. Well, depreciation, think about it. We debit depreciation expense, we credit accumulated depreciation. So notice we did not credit cash. Therefore, this is a non-cash expense. Amortization, same concept, but that expense and other non-cash expenses. Also, we need to be aware with discounts on bonds payable. When we have discounts on bonds payable, what's gonna happen is the, the discount will increase the interest expense. So whatever we discounted, it increases interest expense. Well, it increases the expense. So the expense was deducted and it increases. Well, what do we have to do? We have to add back that increase because the discount was not really a cash outflow. Now, the opposite is true for the premium. If we have a premium on bonds and what did, what did the premium do? Well, the premium involved expense. Expense reduces income, but the premium reduces the expense. Notice it reduces the expense. Well, as a result, because it reduces the expense without giving us cash, what do we need to do? We need to deduct as an adjustment. So it's the opposite of a discount. And hopefully this makes sense. Because why? Because the expense went down, but we did not really save any cash. Well, what happened is to adjust that premium, that additional reduction in the expense, that additional help, we deducted back. Now, before we proceed any further and discuss other items, I would like to remind you whether you are a student or a CPA candidate, and most likely that's who you are if you are watching. That's most likely who you are. That's great. You have arrived. Go a step further. FarhatLectures.com, where I have additional resources, lectures, multiple choice, true false exercises that's going to help you do better in your accounting course, as well as the CPA exam. I don't replace your CPA review course. I'm a useful addition. I can help you understand the material better. The fact that you are watching is you are looking for some help and you have arrived. If you have not connected with me on LinkedIn, please do so. Take a look at my LinkedIn recommendation. Like this recording, share it with others, connect with me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit. Let's talk about post-retirement benefit cost. Simply put, we are talking about pension expense. Well, sometimes pension expense might be higher or lower than the cash payment made to the trust. So when the company sends this paycheck, to the trust. Well, 
the paycheck, the cash payment might be different. Let me give you an example. The company might debit bad debt, it might debit expense, which is specifically pension expense, 100,000, might credit cash 70, and might credit pension obligation 70. So let's think about this. So we have net income. Before we arrive to net income, we deducted 100,000 in pension expense. This is how much we deducted to arrive to net income. But in reality, we only send a check for 30,000. What does that mean? It means of the 100,000, 30,000 was cash, 70,000 was non-cash. So what do we have to do when we are making when we are making the adjustment? Well, we have to add back 70,000. We have to add back 70,000. Now, let's assume another scenario. We debited expense, pension expense to be specific, 150,000. So, so now we are dealing with net income here and we deducted 150,000 in pension expense. But we credited cash 200,000, we sent a check for 200,000 and the difference either we owed the the um, the pension benefit or we added money to the trust. Either or it doesn't matter whether the debit is a to pension obligation or to the asset to the asset of the fund. The point is we expensed 150 but we paid in cash 200,000. It means we have to deduct from a cash perspective an additional 50,000. Little bit unusual. A little bit unusual. Why? Because usually non-cash expenses are added. Now we are subtracting. And the reason is because we expensed more than what we paid. So this is how we deal with those expenses. And it doesn't have to be this expense. All expenses that follow the same rules, they have to follow this. Basically the same concept. And we will see another example shortly. Let's take a look at the equity method of accounting. Well, how does the equity method work? Well, let's review real quick. Let's assume Adam owns 40% of Avi company. Well, Adam uses the equity method. Avi reported 100,000 in net income and 30,000 in dividend. Let's take a look at, at the journal entries that Adam would do. Adam will debit investment in Avi 40,000, which is 100,000 times 40% would increase their investment. And they will credit revenue from investment for 40,000. And remember the revenue from investment goes into net income. So we have net income. And what we did is we added 40,000 of revenue to come to come up to our net income. Also for the dividend, we debit cash 12,000 only, which is 30,000 times 40%. And we credit our investment in Avi 12,000. Now let's take a look at what happened from a cash perspective. From a cash perspective, we added $40,000, which increased net income. But how much of that 40,000 was only cash? Only 12,000 was cash. The remaining was non-cash. Non-cash. So what do we have to do? We start with net income, subtract 12,000 and add, uh, subtract, I'm sorry, 40 and add 12. So all in all, we'll deduct 28,000 from net income, from net income and to arrive to, to arrive to the proper number. And this is how we deal with the equity method. Losses and gains are another major adjustment to net income. Now bear in mind for the direct method, it's easy because they're already non-cash, therefore we ignore them. For the indirect method, losses add losses back because they are treated as non-cash expenses. Why? Because we before we arrive to net income, losses were deducted. Okay, but losses are non-cash. So what do we do with losses? If we deduct them, then we add them back. Now, gains, the same concept. Gains are the same concept. We Gains are added to come up to net income, but they don't really increase cash. There is no cash inflow, therefore we deduct them. Let's take a look at an example, to, just ex to illustrate this concept. Land with a cost of 100,000 was sold for 110. Let's take a look at the journal entry. We debit cash 110,000. We credit the land and we credit gain on sale. So notice the gain on sale was up here, 10,000, which in turn increased net income. However, the whole amount of cash is counted in the investing section because we said the 110,000 selling the land is an investing activity. Therefore, 
the additional that additional gain of 10,000 is already counted in the investing activity and it's considered a non-cash inflow from operating perspective therefore we deduct it and we remove the land obviously this will be also an investing activity so the point to remember is the gain was already accounted for if you're if you're saying but i really had a ten thousand dollar cash gain yes that's fine the additional ten thousand was considered investing take it out of operating if not at least you're you're double counting it if you don't you know if you're not understanding how it's not a non-cash revenue now the same concept would apply if you sold this land for 90,000, if you sold the land for 90,000, you would have a loss on sale of 10,000. Again, the loss would have deducted deducted your net income, reduced your net income by 10,000 because it's deducted, but it, you did not really lose 10,000 of cash, therefore you add back the loss. And hopefully this will this this did it. Basically did it in a sense clarified it and here we are talking about realized gains and losses let's talk about unrealized losses and gains unrealized holding losses and gains and what's the difference between unrealized and realized unrealized means you did not actually sell the investment you did not sell the asset you did not sell the item you have it on the books and you're gonna mark to market well we have to be careful here because we could, we could have three different scenarios for those unrealized holding gains and losses. We could have trading debt securities, trading debt investments, which they will incur unrealized holding gain loss. Well, unrealized holding gain and loss for those type of investments are listed on the income statement. Well, if they are listed on the income statement, that's easy. They follow the same rules as the previous regular Regular means realized gains and losses because they affected net income. And as a result, loss is added and gains are deducted. That's one category. The second category is that investments, now they are available for sale, not trading. Well, what do we have to know about this group? Well, this group, any unrealized holding gain and loss is reported in comprehensive income, which is part of the balance sheet. What does that mean? Well, good. That's easy. No effect on income. Therefore, we ignore them. So you have to be very careful. If you are dealing with that investment available for sale and they're giving you unrealized holding gains or holding losses, just simply from a cash flow perspective, you don't have to worry about them, whether the direct or the indirect, because they did not affect net income. Therefore, from an operating perspective, you ignore them. Three, unrealized gains and losses when you own less than 20%. Well, what do you have to know about this group? This group goes into net income. So any unrealized gain or loss goes into net income. Well, that's easy. If it goes into net income, we're back to one. If we're back to one, it means we follow the same rules. We follow the regular gains and losses as we saw on the previous slide. Stock options. What is stock options? Well, stock options when the company grant options as a form of compensation to their employees. What entry do we make when we grant st stock options? We debit. Compensation expense, that's assume 10,000, we credit paid in capital stock option 10,000. Well, I hope you already just know this real quick. It's an expense and it's a non-cash expense. Simply put, non-cash expense, we ignore for the direct method. For the indirect method, we add back as a non-cash expense. So we'll take net income plus 10,000 for the non-cash expense, just like depreciation, amortization, bad debt expense, any non-cash expense. But I just want you to pay attention to stock options because stock options could be buried, could be part of your compensations or salaries expense. Therefore, you might have to take it out. Let's talk about a change in deferred taxes. Let's assume we are recording a deferred taxed asset. Now, if you don't know what's deferred taxed asset, I, I can't explain it in this session. The assumption is you know how this work. You can go to Farhat Lectures. Otherwise, you will see the journal entry and hopefully it will make sense for now. You will debit deferred taxed asset 10,000 and you will credit deferred. When you record deferred taxed asset, it means you are saving on your income tax expense now. So notice what happened to your expenses. Your expenses went down. So simply put, if we're talking about net income, what happened is you have an expense and that expense, it's like a plus expense. What do I mean? Because usually expenses, you get deducted to come up to net income. Now it's adding to your net income. It's a plusing your net income. It's adding to your net income. Why? Because your expenses are going down. It's like a plus. So think about it. What happened is this. You reduced your expenses by 10,000, which is but there was no cash inflow. You did not really have an additional 10,000. No, no one gave you 10,000. 
so you ded deduct it since you since it reduces your expenses here you will need to deduct this from your net income so basically the opposite of non-cash expenses that we learn about because under non-cash expenses you deduct the expense that's non-cash then you add it now what you're doing is you're the opposite since it reduces your expenses without bringing you cash you will deduct it from operating it's a little bit unusual just you just have to be careful unusual and unfrequent items they could be sometime investing or financing activities for example land condemnation by the government as a result you could have a gain or a loss you treat it just like you would treat gains and losses account receivable well you have to be careful with account receivable because we are dealing in the allowance for bad debt because with account receivable comes allowance for bad debt remember allowance for bad debt is a contra asset account so any change add back the increase in the change remember it's kind of the opposite of receivable let's let's take a look at some numbers if we have in year x1 we have 90,000 in receivable in x2 account receivable was 107 so notice account receivable increased by 27 now we know from a cash flow perspective the adjustment is negative to cash flow why because you sold more on account it means you are not receiving the cash therefore it's negative cash flow that's fine let's take a look at the related allowance account well the related allowance account went from 10,000 to 15,000 that's also an increase of 5,000 also an increase but notice from a cash flow perspective since the allowance is the opposite of a regular regular asset you add to cash flow so simply put what you do you net them out therefore the increase the 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 net is an increase 12,000 net increase and obviously that's overall a negative to cash flow now bear in mind for the direct method you ignore the allowance because it's part of bad debt expense you would you, you would use the gross receivable when you are analyzing your sales let's talk about working capital which is current assets minus current liabilities that's what working capital is and sometimes you might have changes in working capital that you need to be aware of it like unusual changes like what well it might affect cash but not net income therefore they are not part of your income well let's assume you purchase short-term securities which is that's fine if you purchase short-term securities that's considered operating that's fine however if you issue short-term non-trade notes payable simply put you borrowed for short-term basis well short-term is current liabilities you would say well this should affect my operating section it's not when you are borrowing money it's financing be aware of this also when you declare dividend you might have a dividend not you might you will have a dividend payable again dividend payable is a current liability you might be thinking well let me let me compute the change in my dividend payable and include it in operating not at all dividend payable is a financing activity just be aware of those couple things now you might also have non-cash transaction that are significant what do you need to do with those you need to report them or disclose them like what exchange of non-monetary asset you exchange a truck for another truck building for another building there's no cash ex exchange exchange of long-term debt by another debt basically refinancing you took one debt you exchange it for another debt you did not really receive any cash all that happened is one debt replaced the other non-cash transaction you purchased asset by issuing debt including capital leases again non-cash you purchased assets by issuing stocks equity non-cash you converted that or preferred stock into common stock again non-cash you exchange equity for that you gave them some stocks instead of the debt non-cash transaction what do you need to do with all of those report or disclose make sure they are available so the users of the financial statement will make more sense of the numbers what should you do now go to farhat lectures and work mcqs true false questions that's going to help you understand this topic better don't shortchange yourself study hard good luck and of course stay safe